Up next, one of the greatest songs from a movie soundtrack ever, partly sung by a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer from a duo who had been out of the limelight for years, and a movie that many didn't even think would get released in theaters. With everything against them, these two songwriters just persevered. The unbelievable story of this song, next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you want to experience the stories of your music straight from the artists who created them, this is your place. Subscribe below right now. To get even more content and even become a producer of this channel, make sure that you check us out on Patreon. You'll get even more content. Now, I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs. On this particular installment of Revelations, just in time for Valentine's Day, we speak to Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers and two of the songwriters behind the number one 1987 duet I've had the time of my life, John D. Nicola and Frankie Previtt. Frankie, the, the front man of early 80s group, Frankie and the Knockouts, who had a knockout top 10 hit in 1981 with Sweetheart. Love that song. Sweetheart. I've Had the Time of My Life is, of course, the main song from the 1987 blockbuster hit, Dirty Dancing, starring Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey. Duet, of course, sung by Bill Medley and the elegant Jennifer Warrens, who had another number one movie hit with the late Joe Cocker, Up Where We Belong from An Officer and a Gentleman. The is on where we belong. This is such a compelling story of how this song came to be. You're gonna love it. Watch it with your loved one. As we go into this session, I wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, my personal choice for seeing. Go design your own and get digital blue light protection can also do a 3D virtual try on before you get them. Treat yourself today at zenny.com. Here is the story of the duet. I've had the time of my life for Dirty Dancing. Nothing could ever prepare you guys for what was to be two of the biggest songs ever. Two standards. I've had the time of my life and Hungry Eyes. late 86, Jimmy Einer, Millennium Records, asked you about writing some music for a little movie, a little movie called Dirty Dancing. Tell me about how that all came together. Well, there was that two-year period after Jimmy sold us to MCA, and MCA wanted us to sound like Night Ranger. That didn't really work out and dropped us. And so I'm writing more songs and you know, Hungry Eyes, I had already written with John, so that was on my demo reel for the next, you know, Frankie and the Knockout record, which nobody heard or liked. You know, it wasn't getting us too far. So, take the good with the bad. so we, I continue to write songs, and out of the blue, Jimmy Einer calls, and he says, hey, you know, I got this little, little movie I want you to, you know, write a song for it. My response to him was, Jimmy, I really don't have the time. I'm trying to get another deal. I'm writing here, I'm writing songs for this next knockout record. And he goes, make time, this is gonna change your life. And I'm like, yeah, you're gonna change my life. You know, you shut your label down, you sold this to MCA, that didn't work out, you're gonna change my life. I said, yeah, I think you already did that. And he goes, no, I got a good feeling. I got a good feeling about this movie. And I said, oh, oh okay, what's the name of the movie? And he goes, Dirty Dancing. And um, my hand went to my forehead and I went, oh my God, Jimmy's doing porn. You know, I'm thinking he's doing a porn flick, you know, Dirty Dancing. And I'm like, really, Jimmy? You really, you want me to write a song for this? And he goes, no, 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 it's a good movie. It's a, about, you know, he gives me Baby Meets Johnny and the father doesn't like the kid in his Catskill Mountains. And it's for the last scene. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'll call John up, you know, and, and see if we can come up with a track. And uh, he goes, okay, that's the good news. The bad news is that it's for the last scene and it's seven minutes long. And you gotta write a seven minute song. I'm like, oh man, MacArthur Park. I gotta write MacArthur Park. Was never waiting for us, girl. It ran once and so I called John up and I gave him, you know, here's the good news and here's the bad news. 
So um, we decided to, you know, have the song start with the, the chorus up front in halftime. Now I have the time of my life. And then on the downbeat of the verse, we'll double time it. John sends me this really cool track. I play it over the phone to Jimmy. He goes, I like it. Make a song out of it. So I'm on the Garden State Parkway exit 140, and I'm paying the toll in Union, New Jersey, and I put this cassette that John sent me into my dashboard, and I'm listening. And how I write a song is I jam to it, and I have to come up with a melody first. And once I find the melody, then I you know, hone in on the lyrics. And sometimes finding that melody, phonetic sounds come out of me. So I'm going, nin, 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 I'm of my life, nin, nin, I'm of my life. What the hell am I saying, you know? And I'm scribbling time of my life on an envelope. And that's where the song, the seed of that song started. And actually the man upstairs wrote the rest of the lyrics because I had no idea what that movie was about. The genre of that music was not anything I would have ever written but because of this call from Jimmy Einer and, and what John sent me, we created this song that helped turn that movie around. I should interject that um, we didn't have the gig from Jimmy Einer. It was, we were in, our song was thrown in with 150 other songs. It wasn't like, Correct. hey guys, Correct. go write this song, you, we're hiring you, you know, you got the gig. We, we were a free for all. That's a good point. You know, so. In fact, it was a Lionel Richie song that they were trying out at the very end. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, when I met him at the uh, Academy Awards, was like all over me, like, you know, who sang the demo and who did this and who did that? And I'm like, why is that so important? He goes, because we have listened to 149 songs and turned them down. And we filmed at a sequence. We filmed the last scene first. And so we were like, let's get this piece of shit over with. We don't really care for this movie. And he said, when we dance to your demo with you singing and that girl and i said yeah rochelle capelli when, when we did that we looked at each other at the end of the day and went oh my god let's go make a movie he said we had such a great ending the camaraderie for the movie that 150th song that came in that day thank you jesus you know really turned that movie around and the camaraderie for making that movie and and um, the rest is history all the writing on the wall. Let's talk about, from your perspective, John, writing the music. When Frankie got sort of a direction from Jim, uh, Jimmy Einer, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, Frankie, he mentioned a, a Blues Brothers song, and I still have the album, but I can't even remember what song it was. And then the other one was... Uh, Donna a summer song, was it? No, it was Irene Cara. Um, oh, right, right. What a feeling. Which also starts slow, you know, right, for right. that kind of slow entry that goes into a dance thing. Musically, we knew it had to be uh, like a dance feel, you know. And at the time, things were um, kind of um, sequenced, you know. It wasn't just played live, you know, right, right in the 80, mid-80s, 86. You know, a DMX drum machine, you know, uh, uh, was what was used. And you sequenced it, you know, along with your recording thing. And... I didn't have any of that gear, so I called out to my friend Donnie Markowitz, who I was working with uh, on some other project, because I knew he had that that gear. So we went into you know Donnie's living room, basically, which had the DMX. You remember the old DMX drum machines? Yeah. Um, people are starting to use them again, actually. Originally, this it was a synth bass. It was boom, 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 boom. it was an electric guitar bass. It was. Because we were thinking, you know, we were thinking mid '80s. You know, everything was sounding like that. So, um, and uh, you know, we just kind of scratched together the tracks, um, made that verse sort of, you know, build. You know, that has that, you know, sus uh, you know, suspended and then release, suspended release. And then the B verse, you know, kind of doing a, you know, off the five chord. And to coming into this big chorus. Because I 
what Donnie and I always talk about um, as far as musically, what kind of separates the, the time of my life from a lot of other songs. It has the, you know, the, the, a lot of songs, almost every song in the 50s was one six two five or one six four five chord changes. We had somehow we we landed on this, you know, from the one chord down to the six, which you hear still every every day on so many songs. But we went to the flat seven chord. So it's, you know, E to C sharp minor to D and then to the five chord. And that kind of opens up a whole, you know, Frankie heard it, obviously, and the melody came to him. It opens up something that's kind of euphoric. You know, it's a little different than a one six four five or one six two five, and uh, I, I think um, you know that's that's a subtlety that. Uh, and then the bridge goes down to the key of D, so you know it mod modulates down. So there's all that you know, boom, 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 boom. when he's taught, they're talking on the screen. It looks wonderful out there. And. Um, and then it bursts back into that, you know, chorus. So, and I hope to you. you know, there's a bit of euphoria, and uh, some of it is is to do with key changes and chord changes that were slightly out of the left field. And who knows how they ended up? You know, Emil, as I said the other day to Frankie, Emil Ardolino, who was the director. There's a lot of things that no one could put together, they just fell together. They just came together. You know, I don't think anybody at the time thought Dirty Dancing was gonna be, you know, it wasn't like the largest, Vestron Pictures was a small film company. And, you know, no one could predict where we'd be still talking about it 33 years later. Even to the point, John, that um, RCA and Vestron Films weren't on the same page of the release date and so, RCA released the record, uh, Time of My Life, and it started going up the AC charts and they called Vestron and said, where's the record? And they go, uh, where's the movie? Well, uh, we're gonna move the movie back a month. And they said, well, take your little record and your song and take a hike. So now Vestron Films was going to put out the movie for two weeks and send it to DVD. And within those two week period, 300,000 records got back ordered for Time of My Life in that movie. And then by the time RCA could print a record, there was a million records back ordered. So now when I look at the popularity, it was driven by Joe Public, it, by people, not by the, the machine. The machine showed up later when they realized there was success to help propel it, but the initial embrace of the phenomenon was done by the public. Yeah, RCA wasn't wasn't that excited about it. You know, I remember no. going into remember that they had some Grammy thing just before. Yes, uh, they had a party. They didn't After, even invite we, us. We didn't even get money. <laughs> we didn't even exactly. get invited. Uh, but and I remember Eleanor Bergstein, who is one of the writers, uh, is the writer of the movie. She. Um, she said, "You know, they, they kept pushing. Uh, who who did uh, you don't own you don't own me on the record? N not the original. Wall monkeys. RCA's focus was on the blow monkeys, and Eleanor so much wanted Leslie Gore's version. You know, that's that's where RCA was at that moment. So they they almost grudgingly." Like you said, Frankie, it was forced on them because it was so popular. Yeah, I had said to Jimmy when it fell off the charts, they had uh, done a premiere in New York and we were at this party afterwards. And I said, Jimmy, well, what's the what's the story? The song fell off the charts. There's no movie. The, you know, what's going on? And he goes, don't worry about it. We're just going to tell radio we re remix it for them. We did a special radio mix. And then we'll re-release it, you know? And I'm like, oh, good luck with that. <laughs> you know? So there was a lot of crazy things that yeah. happened, but really for the movie, the, the singers on the movie, for Patrick, um, and for the song, if you take one of those elements out, you don't have the phenomenon of Dirty Dancing. You recorded, like you said, a demo with uh, Shel Capelli 
And when you played that at the 150th song, and they heard that, because it also had, as I understand, it had to be to do a mambo beat, right? Yeah, something like... I, I'm not sure like, about that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I know they asked us for more percussion, and we had to put, like, kungas and, and timbales, and we went to Tony Camillo's, and we transferred the track. Which they didn't use on the final. They, they didn't do that. Right. But when they played that demo, even Patrick Swayze made the comment that it was his favorite version. Oh, awesome. Of the song. They had demo lock. They all had demo lock. Eleanor said the same thing. Emil said the same thing. They kind of wanted to use Frankie and Rochelle, you know, originally. They definitely had demo lock. A little note about the time of my life. Um, I remember you getting notes back from um, Kenny Ortega saying that they needed to slow it down a little bit. Remember, it was originally, and so we took the original recording that we did, and we that's when we brought it into Tony's to kind of slow it down a bit. Yeah, yeah, I remember Eleanor wanting some lyrical changes and calling and saying, you know, Johnny would never say this, change it to this, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is what Johnny's saying. Donna Summer and Joe Esposito were originally supposed to record it. Of course, yes. everybody knows who Donna Summer is. Joe Esposito, of course, he had a hit about a year later, Piano in the Dark. He was singing the background on that. Of course, You're the Best from Karate Kid. A song that every 80s kid knows by heart. But as I understand it, the title was too problematic for Donna Summer, the, the movie Dirty Dancing. That's what I always heard. Oh, oh, really? I didn't know that. Frank, do you remember who the... Um, I remember hearing... We knew Bill Medley was singing it, but I remember hearing... They were trying to decide which, which female it was, and I know I know Diana Ross was mentioned, and, I, of course, Jennifer Warrens. Do you remember who... It was like five. Do you remember who the other ones were? Maybe it was Donna Summer. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember, but I talked to Michael Lloyd, who produced the, the song about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, and he was talking about doing um, the song and trying to get Bill involved and Bill didn't want to do it because it was in California and he was in New York and he didn't want to come out. And then when he had heard that um, Jennifer Warren was going to sing on it, he was like, oh, I always wanted to sing with her. You know, so they, they worked it out. So, you know, they talked him into it, but he didn't want to do another duet. His wife was, was having have a, a baby. baby. Right. Jimmy Einer, uh, guy from uh, New York, was putting the, putting the music together for the movie. And boy, did a great job. Some great, they did a great job between doing old songs and new, mm -hmm. and new stuff. And he called me and said, I want you to do a, a, a song for the movie, Dirty Dancing. I turned it down for three months because my wife was expecting our child. They wanted me to go from California to New York. I said, I can't do it. I promised my wife, Paula, that I would be there when uh, she gave birth. And, it, and almost every week, it seemed like every day, he <laughs> called Jimmy Einer and called, said, did she have the baby yet? And I said, no. And uh, finally, it, uh, Paula had, the, had, had our child, McKenna, who's now on the road with me and he singing, sing, with sings yeah. it with me. His daughter, McKenna, now sings it with him. <laughs> exactly. Right. I, that's right. where I was going. You stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry and does a great job the time of my life. so they said jennifer warns uh, wants to sing it with you and and i said i would because she just had this big hit with joe cocker yeah. and i said yeah man of yeah, course uh, a great combination joe cocker and jennifer bonds and i said uh, okay because we we recorded it because we just wanted to sing together we didn't think the movie was going to do anything. Don't forget, too, uh, Frankie sang it up an octave. So yeah. he was in the same range as Rochelle. You know, they were both up there. It's in the key. So, I, that might have, you know, I remember when first hearing that Bill was going to sing it down an octave, kind of being disappointed. I, oh, I don't know if that's going to work. But but it, it, at the end, I think it really did work because it, it really clearly delineated this is Johnny's voice 
and this is baby's voice. You well, know? that was another reason, John, he didn't want to sing it. He was like, right. how am I going to hit those notes? Right. Right. You know, I can't sing right. up there. And they said, and well, just to bring it down the octave. Right. We went in and recorded it. And uh, I was very surprised. They made a great record. They really made a great record. And uh, the movie obviously took off. And and uh, the, the song just went to number one overnight. But what's interesting about it is when you lit, when you, cause we, we, we kind of revisited it recently and to hear the harmony parts, you know, Bill is doing a kind of a, a, a part that's not underneath. Dom- yeah. It's, it's not dominant in the chorus, you know, because right. it, because it, you know, it's, it, it would be too low or yeah. too high to, to be the dominant thing. So he's singing like the, either the fifth or the third, I forget what it is exactly, but it's not like the, it's not like what that you're in. They made such a nice big chord. I mean, we had a chord too, but they made it a little bit bigger. And, and they stuck in a few ad libs here and there, and it, and it kind of worked. Hey, yeah. It did work. <laughs> it didn't kind of work. It did work. Yeah. <laughs> but how cool was it, you guys growing up, talk about Blue Eyed Soul, Frankie and the Knockouts, Bill Medley, the Righteous Brothers. To hear him sing that because you were supposed to maybe sing it what did you think when you heard that well first of all when back in the day when i was hearing all those italian notes from my father those opera notes i was trying to look for the blue notes you know and um so i would do frankie lyman songs and i would do you know all this r b stuff and then when i went into college i heard you know, all of a sudden I heard these two different elements of music that kind of changed me as as an artist, as a writer, as a singer. And the first band that, that turned my head was The Rascals. And then The Righteous Brothers. And hearing those two made me go, that's how I want to sing. That's who I want to be. Bobby Hatfield, obviously, because he was the tenor. But Bill, you know, he had that gravelly baritone, soulful, and the Rascals were like, I was all over the Rascals and became friends with some of those guys and still am today. They just changed me as a where I was and what I wanted to do with my life. So there were big influences to have Bill Medley sing time in my life. It was like, thank you. Thank you. Those moments, um, what's the second huge hit? Um, but with you, baby, without you, baby, what good am I? Soul inspiration. That, that, that moment, right? That voice is gorgeous and it, it moves your soul. I guess that's why it's soul music. Yeah. <laughs> My soul and really inspiration. Good. Yeah. Soul yeah. And inspiration. I actually like that better than I mean, I love them both, but that one, God, it's it's a moment where you just get chills, you know. I wonder if they were thinking Bill Medley too, though, because of how well you've lost that love and feeling did with Top Gun the year before. Yeah. I think what they did was um, they needed a thread to connect this 1986 uh, pop music to 1964. So you have a pop 86 sounding track and the connecting thread was a voice from the 60s, which made you feel that you were listening to a Righteous Brothers song back in the 60s. And I think that was the thread for me. That's what I think. When Michael Lloyd um, produced the final version, a lot of it was taken from what we had done. A lot of the uh, sonically, a lot of the guitar part, keyboard part, stuff like that. They did, add, they did hire Gene Page to do that. Da, 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 da. Which yeah. is very reminiscent of the string part in um, "You Lost That Love." Yeah. Were you guys there at all when they recorded it? 
No, no. But I've been in Michael Lloyd's studio many times. He grew yeah. up with Jimmy Durante kind of as his mentor and, and right. close friend of the family. It was like he, a father. He, he was like a father to him. A kiss is still a kiss. Well, the song, when they get to that part before you go into the big, big finale, where it slows down, is I've had... Yeah, it breaks down, yeah. Hey, the time of my life. That is so amazing. I feel like that's what made the song really... Um, I mean, it was a great song. You get to that part, though, and it slows it down, and then you go, boom, you go back into that last chorus where there's so much joy. Climb up to it. Well, that was on the original demo. I mean, that's yeah. that's the part of the arrangement that, you know, that was there originally that John, you know, kind of put together. So, you know, they, you know, a, as a compliment to all, us as writers, that they would take, you know, a lot of what we did and, and you know, replicated it. Well, let's talk about the success of it. Um, I mean, it helped propel the album to sell 48 million, almost 50 million copies worldwide, which is just mind blowing. I mean, there have only been a few records in the history of popular music that have done that. The album was number one for 18 weeks, which right. that's like Prince Purple Rain, Michael Jackson thriller territory. Yeah. But the hat trick, being nominated for a Golden Globe, Oscar, and Grammy, won a Golden Globe and an Oscar, number one on the Hot 100 on the AC charts, number six in the UK. And then in the UK, it went back on the charts again in 1991. Right. Went to number eight. Number one in Canada, Belgium, Australia, Netherlands, South Africa, top five pretty much everywhere else. What did you think when the success started happening? I mean, it had to be mind-blowing. You get numb because it's happening to you. I think for a while, the reality of this doesn't really sink in until some time later. And, um, you know, having the song become ASCAP's song of the year, which means the most played song in the world, to me is uh, as important of an honor as the Academy Award, because now when ASCAP sent me a an email saying, here are the top 20 songs ever played. And you're number 15 out of the top 20 songs ever played. So those honors are right up there with, you know, the Academy Award, the Golden Globe, the Grammys that, that we uh, were, you know, one nominated for and, and won. All of those experiences are what keeps you uh, realizing that when you send your music out now, people listen to it with different ears. You know, it's, it, it, it really, for me, changed my life, you know? John, what about you? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I've obviously changed my life. You know, here I sit in a recording studio in my barn upstate New York. That wasn't happening without this, you know, unless something else happened. But, you know, I, I, it's enabled both Frankie and I to stay in the business, stay um, you know, active and and um, and pick projects and do things that we that we want to do. Well, I'll tell you what. Sitting down when I was a kid, watching MTV, my parents were gone all that summer because my dad was building a home for us and he was busy. My mom was busy, so I sat in front of MTV, twenty four seven, and I just remember I've had the time of my life coming up all the time, every hour on the hour, loving it. Of course, my, my parents bought the album. That's the thing about Dirty Dancing is everybody bought the album. It wasn't just a kid's thing. It was a parents. It was kids. It was grandparents. Everybody was listening to this record. That's why it became a phenomenon. Everything just came together in a way that no one could have forced. It just, it just happened. I remember when it, was, it, hadn't, it wasn't a hit movie yet. It wasn't a hit song yet. Uh, one of the first showings I saw was on the upper west side where i had an apartment on the upper west side of new york in the movie theater and i was in the theater maybe the first week it came out and i remember you know at the end of it sitting in my seat i kept you know watching the credits i wanted to see my name up there and i noticed there was a lot of people in, in front of me sitting there and they were waiting 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 to go oh that's it the time of my life that's the you know so i knew there 
I said, we got some lightning in a bottle here. These people were waiting to, to know the name of that song. You know? To watch the credits. They watched yeah. the credits. It's amazing to me to be sitting in that little rental house that we had, watching MTV like crazy and seeing these songs, and then 25, 30 years later interviewing you guys. As a little kid, I never would have believed that. Talking about the legacy of the song so many years later, you think about all the covers of this song. I mean, the Letterman. I've been waiting for so long. Now I finally found someone to stand by me. Canadian Idol, American Idol, Taylor Hicks and Catherine McPhee. I mean, they sing it on the finale there. Barry Manilow. This could be love because what are your thoughts when you hear the covers of it? Um, I, I don't think, you know, you could do a cover of the song. I don't think anybody has topped Bill Medley and, and, and Jennifer Warren's version um, uh, rendition of the song. So it's, it's uh, gratifying that people want to, you know, record your music and, and are inspired to do so and put it out on a record. I mean, we had the Black Eyed Peas who recorded just using the chorus. The time of my life. And it ended up going like number four. You know, they played it at the Super Bowl. So there's something about that chorus that gets people off, you know? Glee. Bob's Burgers. The, the Darkness, the band, they actually <laughs> play the song after every live show. It's kind of a little thing that they do. They play it after, after every live show is over. The Darkness. They play the original recording? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's crazy. They play it. It's kind of... You know, you, uh, you're, men you're mentioning a lot of these covers. I, I don't, how many have you heard, Frankie? I haven't heard that many covers. Uh, I've heard some, um, you know, the uh, Barry Manlow was produced by Michael Lloyd. I haven't heard that one. Well, in pop culture, even using the original song like Crazy Stupid Love. Oh, God, this is ridiculous. I don't want to do it. <laughs> Fuller House just used it. Did you say Get Out? Get Out used that it, right? Was wacky, man. That, that was a wacky, wacky movie. <laughs> Wacky, u wacky usage of the song. There she is, about to kill this guy. <laughs> She's playing the. Dancing with the stars. This could be love Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton when they took the debate. So oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> And then the TV commercial, Eli Manning, Dell Beckham Jr. Just let him dance. KFC commercial. The time of my life. As you said, chosen as ASCAP top 20 songs ever written. And I mean, one of the most iconic in movie history, that scene with that song playing. I think the biggest thing, though, that's got to really touch you guys' heart is that is it creates that that kind of that dream for every little girl that sees that movie. Every that that is every woman's favorite movie. My wife, let's watch Dirty Dancing. You know, it does have that uh, becoming of age moment for, you know, baby all encompassing. It, it becomes a favorite him realizing that, you know, she was more than what he gave her credit for. And what a finale to end with all that joy. I mean, is there a more joyous scene? What about you, John? What are your th final thoughts? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, first of all, one of the enduring, uh, one of the reasons it endures is you could be an eight-year-old girl or an 80-year-old woman, and it's interchangeable. They they all love it. I, I don't. I, I can't really explain it. I think Patrick is a huge part of it. I I I think the song. It's it's a song. It's a meld of the of what you see on the screen and that song. It's and and you know it's Romeo and Juliet. Really, it's it's the wrong side of the tracks guy with you know. Um, so it's a it's a tried and true story. Uh, 
brought together in a time of, of American innocence, 1963. And I'm not sure there's anybody else I could see other than Patrick to do it. Well, you know, something, speaking of Patrick, John and I uh, have kind of done something together and taken these original demos. Uh, I contacted the, the uh, Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. We put them out for sale on Facebook. Uh, so it's Dirty Dancing Demos on Facebook where people can actually buy a piece of history and own those demos that Baby and Johnny dance to, plus a song that's in the stage play called Someone Like You. And we donate those proceeds to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network in Patrick's honor. And it, it just, you know, it gives you a piece of uh, piece of history and you can own a little bit of that movie. Uh, one last thing. Um, when you see the play, or, you know, you talk about the bigness of that final scene, the play, uh, which has been worldwide, that in that context, it's almost the whole play seems like a build, build, build to that final scene. It, it's just more... It, Kind of that way in the movie, but in the play, it's you can sense it, you feel it. Everybody in the audience is waiting for that big, you know, finale, you know, and they and they kill it. I mean, it's great to see it live. It's basically seeing the film come off the celluloid. Thanks for watching. Leave us a comment below about this song, about the great Bill Medley and Jennifer Warren's. What other duets should we cover on this show? Tell us below. If you dig this video, we do it every day and invite you to subscribe so you never miss out to get Dirty Dancing on vinyl or even on DVD for your loved one. You can watch it together, listen to it together. Click on the Amazon links below to get even more content. Check us out on Patreon. We'd love to have you. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.